I've been wrestling and uh, meditating on this uh, uh, thought, and I've been reading, studying, and realized that we can't exhaust this, uh, this topic in one week, or even a couple of weeks, but we're going to spend a, a few weeks uh, thinking about the subject of forgiveness. And uh, we're grateful uh, that as a child of God, we are forgiven of our sins. But there's so much that goes on in, in our life. There's so much that we do. Uh, there's so much that we have done even prior to uh, becoming a Christian. I know there's, uh, unlike many other places, there's a lot of us here that uh, trusted Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, uh, out of our teen years. You know, statistically, it's most people are going to come in saving faith uh, in the Lord as a child. Uh, but uh, we break statistics here all the time, uh, but uh, that's not necessarily the case, and grateful for it. I'm grateful for God's long-suffering, His grace, and His mercy in our life. But when you think about forgiveness, I, I googled and, and watched many different stories, heart-wrenching stories of people. Uh, one was a police officer uh, that got uh, killed by somebody that accidentally shot him as he went to his house and she was in the wrong house and on the court stand, uh, setting in stage, the brother got up there and just said, I forgive you. My brother would forgive you. My brother would want you to know the Lord Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. He turned to the judge and uh, said, can I give this lady a hug? And the judge uh, let him go down and hug, uh, hug the individual. And uh, she admitted before she left the courtroom, I don't even own a Bible. Here's this guy telling that uh, I need, uh, I'm been forgiven and that God would forgive me and I don't even own a Bible. The judge gave the, uh, um, at, after the sentences, gave that, uh, the defendant uh, her Bible off the, off the stand uh, to take to, to jail with her. Um, and we left uh, Florida. The year we left Florida, a teenager was riding his car uh, got on his cell phone, veered off the side, and ran over and killed a little kid that was uh, in, playing in his driveway. And the parents uh, on the news, you can Google it, uh, forgave this teenage boy uh, and, and this accident. And, and we hear those stories and that, that forgiveness. Uh, we, the year we moved up here, the guy went into the Amish schoolhouse up in Lancaster and took those kids hostage and, and killed them. And they, as a community, forgave that guy. And we understand that part of forgiveness, but today I want you to think about this part of forgiveness, the one that did the, the incident. The thought would be, do you forgive yourself? You, you've received forgiveness, but you have done this deed and you've done something and you live with that in your, in your life. 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, he says this, um, That's not there. <laughs> I'll get there. I, I'm glad you guys got there. <laughs> he says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So God has told us that he will forgive our sins. He will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You can go into the bookstore, you can look at many different books, and you can uh, get this topic about forgiving yourself. But hopefully you'll hang with me through this illustration, through passage of Scripture in Genesis chapter 50, of an individual and a family that had a problem and the forgiveness and accepting the forgiveness that they were given. And by the end, that we'll see how it works. I grew up in the Roman Catholic Church and uh, you would go to confession, and in confession you go to the priest, and then he would give you something you'd have to do and pray this and uh, that. Um, but a person that grew up in that faith could get absolution from a pope. So that, that would be on an instance that the pope would say that you are no longer guil guilty, you no longer have to feel ashamed. Uh, every aspect of what you have done has been removed from your life. We have a great high priest, the Lord Jesus Christ. So think about it. Most of us have things in our life that we hold on to. 
It hinders us in our Christian walk prior to trust in Christ or even after. Maybe it's things that happen in a short period of time. Maybe it's a word that was spoken. You've heard me say it many times. You know, words are like a bullet out of a gun. Once they're said, you can't take them back. And sometimes it's like that London Tree commercial. You say it and it, you need to get away. It's <laughs> just like, uh, why did I do that? Um, you know, maybe it's a thing that you've hid from somebody. An act that you've done and you just hid and nobody knows. A secret in your life that you would not want to be revealed to anybody. Maybe it's an unethical decision that you made. Maybe it's a time that you took something that wasn't yours, which we call stealing. And the list could go on. You can think of things in, in, in your mind of things that might have happened just one time or instance that you would be embarrassed that you wouldn't think of. But maybe you hold on to that in your Christian walk, walk and you feel ashamed or you, you just keep reliving that in your life. Or maybe it's a lifestyle thing. You've been delivered from drugs, alcohol, infidelity, deception, hate, lies, abusiveness. And that list could go on. A, a lifestyle that you've been delivered from. God said he's forgiven you, but you still hold on to it. Now we could go to David's life. We're not going to go there today. And we could see that there is consequences. There is repercussion for, for our sins. There's things that we still have to, to live with. But when it comes to the issue of forgiveness, the Bible says, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So maybe that thing that would be holding you back, maybe the thing that keeps occurring or a thing that keeps coming up in your mind that you just can't move forward, you just can't get over the fact that, that God forgave me of that. And, and, you know, there is an adversary, there, there is an enemy to the gospel, there is an enemy to the church of Jesus Christ, and the devil, and he's the father of lies, and he would want you to live in defeat when you actually have the victory. If you, your life was a set of diaries, and everything was written down, every thought, every action, everything that you did... Would there be some pages that you'd just say, I wish I could rip that out? Would there be some chapters that you say, God, just get that out of the, my, uh, my life diary? There, there, there would be those type of things. Maybe whole weeks, maybe a whole years, maybe a whole section of our life, we would want to, to just disband. We don't want to feel the guilt. We don't want to live in defeat. So I want to talk today how to experience total forgiveness. How to experience total forgiveness. So the, the mindset is that we got to forgive ourselves. God has forgiven us. But really, I want you to focus not on the fact that I've got to forgive myself. I want you to experience the total forgiveness that God forgives you. And in, to do that, we got to get our eyes off of ourselves and our eyes into the one that forgave us of our sins and who he is. In Genesis chapter 50 is a familiar passage of, of Scripture. You've got uh, Joseph. You know, the life of, of Joseph, uh, he got uh, uh, sold into slavery because his brothers got jealous. His dad had given him a, a coat of many colors, and he kind of, he wasn't meek and mild. He was a little prideful and boastful, and, you know, he wore that coat with, uh, uh, with his head up high, and look, look what daddy got me, and and all those things, and one day when he goes out to check on his brothers, they scheme. They come up with a plan, and, and actually they, they really went, set out to kill him. They put him in the ditch and leave him for dead. One of the brothers speaks up and says, hey, we could sell him. And as the uh, army comes by, they sell him into to slavery. He goes, and he, the Lord's hand was upon his life. He had favor of God on his life, and he moved up as Pharaoh's house, and he had free reign of pretty much everything. And the temptation uh, that he has of Pharaoh's wife that uh, tries to seduce him, not just one time, but multiple times, and she corners him, and he flees, he runs. But she grabs a hold of his jacket and leaves behind the jacket, and she lies about Joseph, and he gets thrown into jail. And then in jail, 
he interprets dreams and he just says, remember me. And the, they, uh, others are released and the king has a dream. And they say, we know one that could, can help you. And Joseph interprets the dream. He rises back up with Lord's favor again. There's a famine in the land. Now his brothers that lied to dad, to Jacob about Joseph and said he would, had died. Now they come into Egypt and here's Joseph in, in uh, power, as a, like the prime minister. And they're there for a number of years. Some say 10 to, 10 to four, uh, 17 years before the, the father had died, where we reach, reach in chapter uh, 50 of Genesis. But the brothers, we focus on Joseph that had forgiven the brothers for what they have done. But the brothers that hold on to, they're operating like dad's gone now. Joseph has an opportunity now to get back at us. So they have, they have received forgiveness from Joseph. Joseph actually goes to the Pharaoh and they get favor from the Pharaoh and they get this great piece of land and, and, and they have uh, places for their cattle to graze and everything that they, they get handed down to them. But now that Jacob dies, they're, they're worried that Joseph now is going to come after them and, and seek retribution from him. And we know that Satan likes to bring back those memories of what goes on. So they're going back. Now that the patriarch's gone, Joseph now can do what he wants. He, he's not going to disappoint daddy now. So that's where they're at in their mind. They're, they're struggling with the fact that uh, here they are and they're under Joseph's power and, and they're wrestling with this idea. So how can we experience total forgiveness? We'll look at Joseph and learn, learn that, uh, from it. Accept the fact of uh, our guilt is not seated in our faith. Our guilt is godless. It's not seeking after God. Look at verse 15. And when Joseph's brethren saw that their father was dead... They said, Joseph will preadventure hate us and will certainly require of us all the evil which we did unto them. So here's their mindset. Joseph had forgiven them and they're in their mindset said, Dad, Daddy's gone. He's going to come after. He's going to seek retribution from us. Verse 16, he, and they sent messengers unto Joseph saying, Thy father did command thee before he died saying, So shall Ye say unto Joseph, Forgive, I pray thee now, the trespasses of thy brethren and their sin. For they did unto thee evil, and now we pray thee, Forgive the trespass of the servants of God, of thy father. And Joseph wept when they spake unto him. So they created this lie again. We nowhere in Scripture have been given... Um, the, the brothers that were not giving... Uh, orders from the dad that, hey, when I'm gone, remind Joseph to forgive you. They come up with this because they're fearful of the retribution. And Joseph wept when they spoke this letter to him. When, when he heard this, he was grieved in his heart. I'll tell you this. That's probably how God feels when we're walking around. God says, hey, I've forgiven you. And we're walking around and we're carrying that burden. He says, come unto me, all you that labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Come unto me. He's going to give you peace. He's going to set you free from the bondage of your sin and the weight of your sin. And, and here's Joseph. He's weeping because the brothers are saying, hey, you need to forgive us. And his brethren also went and fell down before his face. And they said, behold, we be thy servants. And Joseph said unto them, fear not, for am I? In the place of God. we got to accept the fact. One of the greatest results of guilt is that it causes us to struggle with trust. One of the greatest effects of guilt in our life is because it holds us back from fully trusting. The brothers were walking around knowing that years ago we did our brother wrong. Years ago we, we, uh, we left him for dead. Then we sold him into slavery. Then we told dad that he had died. We, we did Joseph wrong, but they have not forgiven themselves. They ha have not received the forgiveness that was offered to them 
from Joseph, and, and they're walking around with this guilt holding them back. See, if we understand God and fully understand the forgiveness that God has given to us, He has set us free from that. See, the devil is weighing you down. The devil is trying to get you to focus on that. Trying to get us to focus that, hey, you're no good. You can't do that. You can't do that. Remember what you did years ago? Remember that lie? Remember this or that? Remember that lifestyle? Remember all those things. He's trying to beat you down and God says, hey, it's forgiven. You got a new identity in Christ. You're a child of God. He, he said that He has chosen to remember your sins no more. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. For He had made Him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that knew no sin, that, he, that Christ, that knew no sin, He took on the sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God through Him, in Him, in God. We are His righteousness. That's where we stand. Jesus not only died for our sins, but He took the sins upon Himself so He could give us His righteousness. You stand before a holy God, right with God, not based on anything that you have done. Get, get, we've got to get back to the, the basics. Is we stand right because of what Jesus Christ has done, and we stand in His righteousness. And then he says in Psalm 103, verse 12, As the east, as far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed your transgressions from us. As far as the east is from the west, they're in two different directions. And God chooses not to bring the, our sins up anymore. He, doesn't, he, does, he throws them away. One, as one person says, he, he throws our sins in the sea of forgetfulness and he puts a sign up that says no more fishing. No more getting those things and pulling them back out. You say, well, I can't forget about it. We've got to make a choice not to live in the past. We've got to make a choice to receive what God has given to us. Just as we made a choice to accept uh, His forgiveness of salvation, we make that choice to not live in sorrow or regret and grudging, uh, 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 holding us back from what God wants us to do. Joseph had made a choice. He made a choice to forgive his brothers. And the sins that they sinned against him. Joseph didn't bring it back up. He was not holding bitterness. He, he sought the best for his family. He, he went before Pharaoh and said, Hey, these people are, are, are shepherds and their, their flock has nowhere to eat. And the Pharaoh says, Hey, give them this land over Goshen and it's great uh, land. And they went and dwelt there. Galatians chapter, Genesis 41, verse 51. Joseph named his firstborn son Manasseh. The verse said, And Joseph called the name of his firstborn son Manasseh, for God said, He hath made me forget all my toil and all my father's house. He named his first son. We'll be talking about that tonight, the meaning of names and the names of God. But he said here that he named his son what? Manasseh saying, help me to forget. He has made me to forget all the toil, all the things, all those things from my childhood, from what my brothers had did to me. Here's what he said. Here's what Joseph did. He took his pain and he, went and he gave God his brain. He said, God, uh, uh, they've done this to me. And he yielded over to God and he focused, his focus was on God. As Hebrews tells us, to look unto Jesus, the altar, and finish our faith. We keep our eyes focused on Him. He didn't want to keep living in the past. He did not want to hold and seek retribution to His brothers. That He did not want to live that in His mind. He had forgiven them, and He refused to let His mind be the workshop where the devil was going to do his business. When, when we get to that place... We need to stop, and we need to tell the devil to get out of here. We, we need to say, hey, look, I've been forgiven. Jesus said he has forgiven me all my sins. I've confessed my sin. I've sought forgiveness of God. Get out of here. Get rid of that stinking thinking because it's not of God. It's of the devil. But his brothers still had Satan at work. They still were living 
in, in this uh, regret. They're still la- living with the weight of sin in their life. And with that in their mind, they fully couldn't trust their brother. They're like, at what corner now is he going to come after us? Is he going to set up, us up? Is he going to put us into slavery? Is he going to do something to us? Satan uses, look what I, you have done. Here's a fact based on the word of God. All have sinned. The playing field is level at the cross. We all are sinners. When God looked at, at, at us, we were sin, sinners in need of a Savior. And he said he forgives our sins. Forgiveness is hard. Have you ever had to forgive somebody? We're going to talk about forgiving other people later on. But if you've had to forgive somebody as a hurt, as somebody has hurt you, or maybe a situation that, that Joseph is, is in, it's not easy. The flesh does not want to forgive. The flesh wants retribution. The flesh wants to, to go after and, and seek revenge. But Joseph was not living for himself. Joseph is uh, fearing God, and he's not seeking revenge. So we live in that, look what I have done, because... We find it hard. We, we find forgiveness is a difficult thing. It's a difficult thing for us to extend, so it's difficult for us to accept and to process ourselves. It makes no sense in the human mind. But guess what? It makes sense to God. God said His ways aren't our ways. And God says you were forgiven. If you confess it, I'll, I forgive it. Or the greatness of what if. Look at verse 15 again. And when Joseph's brother saw their father was dead, they said, Joseph will preventure hate us, and he will certainly requite of us all the evil which we did unto him. They're sitting here playing this mind game. What if Joseph comes after? That nowhere did Joseph was set after to go after them, but they're playing in their mind that, hey, he's going to do this. That's a tool of the devil. What if? Or look what I have done. Those type of things. Did Jacob want Joseph to forgive the sons? Yes. But he never told, he never told him that, hey, tell him. Jake, Jake, uh, Joseph had already done it. Like I said earlier, Hebrews chapter 12. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy was set before him endured the cross and despised the shame. For the joy, think about that. His, his joy, his reward for his obedience was your salvation, was my salvation. Literally, joy set before him that we would able, be able to stand before God in His righteousness, that Christ would be able to be seated on the right hand of God to be our advocate. He wanted to stand in your place. He wanted to stand in my place and assure that we were forgiven of all our sins. That was the joy of our Savior that was set before Him, the joy to stand in your place, to, to take upon the sins of all man. Or the fact that I'm sure the brothers continued to sin. I'm sure the brothers continued to sin against Joseph. What we see here in verse 15 and 16 is is probably conjured up another lie. He says, And they sent a messenger unto Joseph, saying, Thy father did command before he died, saying. No. He would have told him specifically as he was dying. He, he, he coming up with this. How many times would Joseph have to forgive his brothers? How many times will they deal with the doubt in their mind? How many times are they going to keep wrestling with this idea? Is Joseph going to keep his word? Is Joseph really seeking out for our best? Is Joseph really forgotten about what we did? Is he not going to hold it against us? But here, here's the thing. God is not a man like you and I. He is able to forgive 
He is able to, to choose to remember our sins no more, not to bring them up and hold them against you. It's our minds, it's our self that lives that way. How many times do you say in, in, a, in a week, will you forgive me? If you're married, you say it more than, more than anybody else. Uh, some of the famous apologies in history. In 1077, the Holy Remper Empire, Henry VI, apologized to the Pope uh, Gregory for the church-state conflicts and proved his remorse. He actually stood three days barefoot in the snow to prove his sorrow. In our lifetime, most of us, it was the apology of President Bill Clinton to his wife, family, for his affair and actions in the White House with Monica Lewinsky. The third would be the tie between Tiger Woods and his apology to his family for letting his family down and regret his transgression. He says, I, and I regret those transgressions with all my heart. Or the apology of Will Smith to Chris Rock for slapping him. Things that we see. You, you get apologies nowadays uh, uh, on the, uh, in the pol politics or on the, uh, on the news. When somebody gets caught, then they're sorry, you know. That's, what, that's the, the extent of it. Here in Egypt, the brothers apologize. Joseph had forgiven them. The Pharaoh had known the forgiveness. The government leaders had known the forgiveness. They've all known what has taken transpired here. And they moved them over to Goshen. Everybody knew that Joseph's forgiveness to his brother was sincere. But the brothers just could not get it. They could not grasp it. Why? It's because in their mind, they're thinking, what would I have done if I was Joseph? And that's where we got to focus on is that we are not God. God is God. And he says, if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just. He will forgive us of all our sins. Cleanse us from our unrighteousness. Joseph wanted his brothers to experience total forgiveness. He wanted them to live and enjoy the time and enjoy the land that was given to them. 2 Corinthians chapter uh, 7, verse 10, For godly sorrow produces repentance, leading to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. Godly sorrow worketh repentance, leads to salvation, not to be repented of. That's the, the good news. You're forgiven of all your sins, that you will stand righteous before God. But the sorrow of the world worketh death. Separation from God for all eternity. Godly conviction leads to repentance and salvation. But worldly guilt leads to nothing but death and separation from God. How can I experience total forgiveness? Second one, accept the gift of God's abundant grace. Accept the gift of God's abundant grace. Verse 19, And Joseph said unto them, Fear not, for am I in the place of God? When it came to Joseph, the way they learned to forgive was to remove himself from God's place. He was not playing God. He was not the judge and the jury in the situation. He, he said, You've, What you did in my, my life, I'm giving over to God. How many of us, we want to seek retribution, or we want to get back, or get even? And, and, and try to, to make things right in, in our mind instead of realizing that they've got to stand before a holy God and God is sovereign and God will work it out and let God be the judge and let God take care of it. That's what Joseph's saying. He's saying, I'm accepting God and what God will do. He turned his brothers over to God. He knew that God was bigger than their sin. He was going to stand before a big God one day and he'd rather... Make a righteous decision at this time in his life. He'd rather do what was right. Often when people sin against us, we take God's position. We, we, we want to punish them. We, we want to get things right. We want to retaliate. 
I've been there. I've been there in ministry. I, I served as assistant pastor. I served as a youth pastor. I've seen things that weren't done properly and just had to say, you know what? God, you're God. And, and you've got the Lord, it's in your hands. Had to forgive and, and move on. But Joseph's brothers assumed deep down that Joseph would not forgive them. But they did not understand that Joseph removed himself from it and allowed God to be God. And that's what he's saying here. For am I in the place of God? No, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to step out of the way and I'm going to let God be God and let God take care of the judgment. When God is in His rightful place, people get forgiven. When we put God in the rightful place in our heart and our life, people get forgiven. If we're going to extend forgiveness, 70 times 7, if we're going to forgive those that offend us, we've got to have God in the rightful place. Seated on the throne of our heart. Keep, and walking with it, not, not just for salvation, but we've got to be walking in the Spirit because the flesh is going to retaliate. The flesh is going to bring it back up. The flesh is going to hold it against you. Has not God been gracious to us? God has forgiven us of all our sins. There's stories, I mean, there's so many biblical illustrations we could go to with the, the stewardships and, and different things that just illustrate it. But just focus on what we have been given. How, how could we not be gracious to other people? Grace isn't cheap. Forgiveness is a big deal. It took Jesus to the cross, nailed to a tree for you and I. Our, our forgiveness cost Him His life. Because the Bible said without the shedding of blood, there is no remission, no forgiveness of sin. That, that there had to be a sacrifice made. Thank God that He loved us enough and He demonstrated that love on the cross of Calvary for you and I. He took upon Himself the penalty of our sin. Psalm 103. Remember he said that um, removed our sins as far as from the east as from the west. He doesn't punish us for our sins because he's removed them from his, his uh, mind. He chooses not to remember them anymore. Here's Joseph 1,800 years before Calvary. But he had put God in his rightful place in his heart. He put his brothers in their rightful place and extended grace to them. Grace isn't something that you earn. It, it, it's not uh, our earned favor with God. It's unmerited. It, it's nothing based on who you are or what we are. It's all a gift from God. And it, Joseph was extending grace. It was a gift that he was given. I'm grateful for the forgiveness of God. Hebrews 4 tells us, Let us come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we might obtain mercy and find grace and help in the time of need. We come boldly to the throne of grace, that we could find mercy and grace. David knew it. Psalm 51. Let's go there. <clears throat> David, uh, sin... David had uh, not only committed adultery, committed murder, was faced with Nathan. And Nathan had to turn to David and said, Thou art the man, you're the one that did all these wrongs. But listen to the heart of David. He says, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according to thy, the multitude of thy tender mercies. Blot out my transgression. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. And cleanse me from my sin. David was a broken man. He had known that he had sinned and he sinned before a holy God. And he cries out to God for mercy in his life. 
I, I like, it, it's not up there, Rick don't have it, but I like verse 10. He says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew in me a right spirit. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Verse 12, Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. What people are missing in their Christian walk today is the joy of their salvation. Why are some people missing the joy of their salvation? It's because they're bogged down with sin and guilt of that sin. Instead of confessing it and seeking God's forgiveness and His mercy, or holding back unforgiveness. Holding back that somebody else has did them wrong and they're holding back and just how can I get back? Hey, Lord, if you just give me an opportunity, I'll get back. It's eating them up. And they're missing out on the joy of the Christian life. And just let God be God and let God take care of things. If you're struggling with forgiving yourself, Read Psalm 51. Read the whole thing. God forgives us not because we're good, but because He's good and because He's God and because He is love. He is unconditional love. He is also a righteous God. We learned about that in Sunday school. Holy God. If you want to just get a glimpse of the character of God and your forgiveness, look at Joseph here. Joseph had every right in his position. He could have put his, his brothers into the dungeon. He could have put them in jail. He could have made them slaves. But he, forgiven, he had forgiven them. He did not hold it against them. They are the ones that are in prison themselves because they're walking around saying, hey, Joseph's going to get back at us. We've got to seek. We'll make up this lie and say, Dad said this. You see the, how they have been captivated by their sin and not accepting the forgiveness. God has for, removed our transgressions. Verse 20. But as for you, you thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good. To bring to pass as it is this day, to save much people alive. God took their actions and recycled it into something good. He says, hey, you meant it for evil. God did it to, for good to bring to pass as it this day, to save much people alive. God was in control. When you thought you were doing me evil, God was, God was with me. God was in control of the situation. Verse 21. Now therefore, fear ye not. I will nourish you and your little ones. And he comforted them and spake kindly unto them. He removed their fear. Here's Joseph dealing his bro with his brothers. You get a picture of the character of God. God does the same thing with us. He removed the transgressions. He remembers them no more. He removed them from, as far as the east is from the west. He removed their fear. So you see the heart of God. You see how Joseph deal, here is an illustration of how God works with us. How can I experience total forgiveness? Celebrate the forgiveness that God has given you. Live in the grace of God. Celebrate the forgiveness that God has given you and live it. Verse 21, Now therefore fear ye not, I will nourish you and your little ones. And he comforted them and spake kindly unto them. He comforted them and spake kindly to them. <coughs> That's what we did when we came together, to get together today to worship. We come together to encourage one another, edify one another, to lift up the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Here's Joseph. He spake kindly unto them. They celebrated, uh, ce celebrated the forgiveness. And then there becomes real fellowship. That, then they can come back together as a family unit. There's, there's not this mindset of, oh, he's going to get even. He's seeking revenge. 
Now they are freed from that. They don't have to fear. They can move forward. That's the same with you and your Christian walk. You don't have to walk around and say, well, God's waiting around the corner and I'm going to surrender to Him in this area and I'm going to take that step of faith. But you know what? Uh, down the road, He's going to come back and He's going to seek retribution for what I did 20 years ago. That's not God. He said, if you come to Him, you confess your sins, it is forgiven. It's the devil and your mind that's keeping you in that trap and it's limiting to you and enjoying what God has for you. Verse 22, he says, And Joseph dwelt in Egypt, he and his father's house, and Joseph lived a hundred and ten years. And Joseph saw Ephraim's children of the third generation and the children of Bacar and the son of Mashes, and they brought up to Joseph's knee. And Joseph said unto his brethren, I die, and God will surely visit you and bring you out of this land unto the land which he sware unto Abram, to Isaac, and to Jacob. And Joseph took an oath to the children of Israel, saying, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry up my bones from hence. So Joseph died, being a hundred and ten years old, and, he and they embalmed him, and he was put in a coffin in Egypt. Joseph stayed in Egypt with his brothers, and their fellowship was unhindered, and then we see that it was restored. This whole uh, uh, picture here of verse 23 of the children and that generation uh, in Hebrew culture, the child was born. He was placed on the knees of his father. You see here the, the different generations that are born and they put the child on Joseph's knee representing that, that he is the, their patriarch, their father. And there is not that bitterness, that's that bond there. There's a real trust now here. And Joseph tells him, tells him uh, that he is about to die. And he gives him some parting instructions. When I die, I want you to carry my bones uh, up in, uh, back to the promised land. Moses took the bones of Joseph with him. Joseph made all the Israelites swear to oath. And his bones made it back to the promised land. They say if you go back and, and you go to the uh, graves of the patriarchs, you'll find the bones there. You'll find the bones in, in the grave. You go to any other world leaders, you go to the, the cemeteries and you go to those places and you dig up graves, you'll find bones of individuals there. They kept Joseph's promise. He, he died and they did get the bones where they were supposed to be and had a burial there. But here's the good news. No matter how hard they try, you know, how, how hard they exhaust they go and they look and they search and they're trying to find the bones of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I got news for you. There is no bones in the grave. They don't find the bones of Jesus laying anywhere because He not only died and was buried, but He rose again and He came back to this earth and now He's seated on the right hand of the throne of God. We serve a living Savior, not like the religious leaders. There, You go to Muhammad's grave, there's bones. You go to Buddha's grave, there's bones. You go to any of these Joseph Smiths and all these others, there's, there's bones. But you go to Jesus' grave and it's empty. So here's the trick. I said, you've got to forgive yourself. Nowhere in the Bible it tells us to forgive ourselves. Here's what you've got to do. Rest in the forgiveness of God and, claim, and see that you have been forgiven by God Almighty. When you grab a hold of the fact that God has forgiven you, you'll stop listening to the lies of the enemy and you'll stop living in the past and we can move forward for the honor and glory of God.